Hello, hello. So do I get a three, two, one, or? Oh, okay. <laughs> We don't do the boyco, boyco. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today for the second Cafe Scientific in 2023. My name is Annemieke Fernorst. I'm the Vice President, uh, Associate Vice President Research at the University of Manitoba. Thank you for joining us here today in the room. And uh, in addition to those of you in the room, I've been told that there are more than 60 people that have signed up to join us virtually. So thank you very much for that as well. I would like to start by recognizing that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota and Dene's people and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories and we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. As a white immigrant from the Netherlands, I have become connected to First Nations through friendship and family. Such connections have helped me to better understand the continued racism that many indigenous people in Canada experience today. We need to work together to remove systemic barriers and bring change. I remain deeply committed to continue to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I'm pleased to be here for this discourse about innovations in the diagnosis and rehabilitation techniques for stroke, the third leading cause of death in Canada. Tonight's presentation takes place in honor of Brain Awareness Week and is presented in association with the Manitoba Neuroscience Network. I would also like to welcome Christine Hood, joining us on behalf of Heart and Stroke. And for people in the room, please feel free to take some information that was made available uh, uh, by Christine. This topic of tonight's discussion is actually quite personal for me because my mother, and she's sitting here in the room, had a stroke 11 years ago. And uh, I remember very much um, how worried we were as a family. And I'm happy to see her here today at the age of 87, alive and well. Uh, hi, mom. Uh, and uh, so I think many of us that uh, are joining us here in the room or online uh, may have similar experience that family members were uh, affected. I'm very grateful for the health care here in Manitoba that was provided to my mom and uh, that made her all right. My mom wanted to be here today. She, uh, she said, I want to be here, part of this. And I think uh, she wanted to be part of this because she is uh, a lifelong learner. And that's really what the Café Scientific is all about. We, uh, we bring a program that brings together expertise, ex uh, people that uh, do research in certain areas, and we connect them with the uh, general public uh, like you. 
And these uh, cafes are scheduled throughout the academic years. They always take place on a Wednesday. And uh, we, we focus on interdisciplinary research that really has an impact on our own community here in Manitoba, but really also around the world. And I would like to uh, mention that if you like the Café Scientific Experience uh, today, feel free to uh, join us for the next one, which will take place on March 29th. And that is about understanding racism during the pandemic in Canada, the U.S. and Mexico. So today, uh, chairing today's panel discussion is Gillian Stobart, and Gillian is from the College of Pharmacy in the Rady Faculty Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. And Gillian's research focuses on molecular biotherapeutics in affiliation with University of Manitoba's Center of Aging. So it's my great pleasure, Gillian, to turn over things to you. And uh, thank you again for all being here today in the room. And for those online, thank you as well. Jillian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anamika. And thank you all for joining us this evening. I was asked to moderate this session because my research is all about investigating how brain blood flow is regulated and how this changes in aging and in diseases like Alzheimer's disease and stroke. So from a professional standpoint, I was very interested in tonight's topic, but it has also become a personal thing for me, just like Anamika said. Um, <laughs> oh, mom, don't cry. <laughs> so <laughs> my mom had a stroke last summer and <laughs> she's, you know, doing well and recovering. But um, yeah, I find myself now someone who looks after somebody who is recovering from a stroke. And so tonight's topic is also very personal for me. So with that, I would like to do a quick overview of the session this evening. So we will do a hybrid Café Scientifique. So there's those of us who are joining us here in the room, um, and as well as people who are joining us online on YouTube. Um, each panelist will briefly speak on their expertise on tonight's topic of stroke treatment and prevention, um, as well as rehabilitation. And then I will open things up for discussion. Um, a microphone will be passed around to the audience in attendance so you can ask your questions of the panel, but we will also be taking uh, questions online via email. So those of you watching from home um, can email the research.communications at umanitoba.ca email address. And um, this email will be monitored throughout tonight's event and we will um, make sure that your questions are read aloud to be addressed by the panel or it, they will be emailed to the panel after the event. The email address um, can be found in the YouTube description for tonight's feed. So please allow me to introduce tonight's panel. On my far left is Dr. Jay Shankar, who is from the Department of Radiology in the Max Rady College of Medicine, which is part of the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, then we have Dr. Amir Ravandi, who is from the Department of Internal Medicine in the Division of Cardiology, which is also part of the Max Rady College of Medicine at the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. And he's cross-appointed to the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences at St. Boniface Hospital Research, uh, well, Albrechtson Research Center. Then we also have Dr. Ruth Barclay, and she is from the Department of Physical Therapy, which is part of the College of Rehabilitation Sciences at the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. So thank you all for joining us. <laughs> and we will start with Dr. Shankar. So if you would please introduce us, introduce yourself and tell us more about your work. Sure. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I am Dr. Jay Shankar, and I am a diagnostic as well as interventional neuroradiologist. And I, I'll explain this a little bit more because that, that matters to what we are going to talk about. So the diagnostic neuroradiologist simply means that I read the CT scan and MRI of the brain and spine. And the interventional neuroradiologist means that I go inside the blood vessel of patients who suffer stroke and pull their clot out. 
to make them recover as fast as possible. And also I treat the brain hemorrhages part. The other part that I do is related to pain management. So a lot of people with back pain, I do treat them as well. So let's focus on stroke today. Right? It's a stroke is very, very important. Uh, and that's the topic in focus today. As we all know that stroke is a devastating condition. I'm not going to repeat what has been already said, but it's very important to remember that 30 years back, we didn't have a treatment for stroke. And now we do. And that is how much progress we have made over these, uh, these many years through research. And research is very, very important. And most of the research that is important in the field of stroke is clinical research, knowing how, how our patient, who is going to suffer stroke, what are the signs of stroke? As you can see, Heart and Stroke Foundation has this banner of FAST. So we, we need to know that. So I'm going to start with, by asking a few questions. I was hoping more people I can see in front of me, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to ask you, how many of you actually know about stroke? Just ra raise your hand. Amazing. So everybody, that's what I was hoping for. And how many of actually, uh, how many of you actually know the signs of stroke so that you can identify somebody's having stroke or somebody had stroke? How many of you know this these signs? Okay, so not everybody. And that's very, very important because that's the first step. Unless we identify, unless we recognize stroke, we can't treat them. And, then, and I know a couple of you already. Uh, who else uh, is can identify themselves as a survivor of stroke? I know two of you, so that's, that's good. Um, perfect. So I'm going to start by saying the pathway. So we, we have to recognize the patient, that patient is having stroke, and each of these steps are important for clinical research. And then we have to transfer the patient to the right hospital. So identification and then transfer is the most important. And remember transfer is very important because the only stroke center, comprehensive stroke center in, prov in the province and in the city of Winnipeg is Health Sciences Center. So if you go to the other, other hospital because you live next to that hospital, you may not get the right treatment at the earliest. So it's very important to call 911 and that's why the time is there. Call 911 because our ambulance drivers know exactly where that person needs to go. Once you're in the hospital, we rapidly go through the scan of the patient. So we scan the patients at the earliest and the ambulance driver actually call the emergency department at the health sciences center so that the team is ready to receive that patient. We hold the scanner for the stroke patient to come in before they even are in the hospital. So that's very, very important. And then once we have the scan done and Cerebral blood flow becomes very important. We do a scan, a special scan called CT perfusion that gives the information on the cerebral blood flow that gives us the information on how much of the brain is already dead and how much more brain is at risk of dying. And that's such an important part because we can't reverse the brain which is already dead, but we can reverse the brain which is not dead yet, but is at risk of dying. And that we can detect on our spatial imaging. And once we find that the patient is the right patient to treat, then we, we go move really fast. You should see one of the stroke code. I think we have a video online or, of a mock stroke code, how fast we move through different steps. We bring the patient to what we call as our cath lab or angio suite, where, um, where we go from the top of the leg we go inside the blood vessel and then we get into the, into the brain through inside the blood vessel so the patient don't feel that. And then we deploy what we call as a stent. It's like a fishnet. So we deploy the fishnet inside the clot and so that the clot gets incorporated into the stent and then we pull the clot out. And one of the dramatic thing that we see many of the times, unfortunately not 100% of the time, is the patients who may not be able to speak, may not be able to move one side of our, their body, start moving, start speaking on the table in front of us immediately after we pull the clot out.
And because of this dramatic change and you, the impact thereof you can imagine, I feel this is one of the most gratifying treatment that I do. It feels so good to see, to make a real difference in one of our patient's life. So have we done enough? Are we done like this is the best we could do for our patients? The answer is no, unfortunately no. With our best of capacity, only 50% patients get back to their previous capacity, so previous life, only 50%. That depends. That is dependent on the time, how fast the patients can come to us. Uh, the clot-busting drug can be given up to 4.5 hours from the onset of symptoms, and the thrombectomy or endovascular thrombectomy that I described just now, fetching the clot out of the brain, that can be done up to 24 hours. I have done, in select few cases, up to 48 hours from the onset of symptoms. But remember, not everybody is eligible for this treatment as the time goes further away from the onset of symptoms. So the key today, if one thing everybody can take away from this session, please, please, please identify, recognize the symptoms and call 911, bring the patient as fast as possible to the Health Sciences Center so that we can save more of your brain and more of the person who is suffering from stroke. So that's very important. What is new? What is more going on? Uh, we are trying to develop some drugs which can freeze the activity of the brain, and then the time window for treatment will get extended further. So we just finished this multi-center trial across that uh, took place across the world, and we are hoping for we are waiting for the final results. There are several other things. The other side of the stroke that is called hemorrhagic stroke, where the brain hemorrhage happens. I'm one of the lead, uh, one of the PI for uh, one of the multicenter trial, where we are trying to develop a new treatment for patients, which hasn't been used so far, and hopefully in next couple of years that will revolutionize how some of the brain hemorrhage patients are treated by the neurosurgeons. So uh, there are a lot of exciting things that are happening. We are trying to extend the window. We are trying to, with a, with a better device, we are trying to go more distal into smaller vessels so that we can pull the clot out for these patients and make them better as fast as possible. And I will try to, uh, I don't know if I have already done my 10 minutes. Uh, so um, what is important is I want to bridge it into the rehab part. The other 50% of the patients who do not necessarily become better from our treatment right away do get better. And even the, all the patients who, who had stroke uh, continue to improve through rehabilitation. And that's where I think uh, uh, one of my panelists will talk more about that. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Ravandi, please. Perfect. <clears throat> uh, nice to have everybody here. Um, so I am originally as a cardiologist, I treat people with heart attacks on a regular basis. So I knew the devastating impact when the clot goes in the right, in the wrong artery or goes in the wrong place. In a setting of stroke, that clot goes in the brain. As Dr. Shankar mentioned, I think time is of the essence. You need to get to that patient, diagnose them quickly so they can do their magical therapies and be able to get that clot out. Where I come in is to be able to understand how we can identify patients early on what type of strokes they have, and how quickly we can get them to the right place to get the right therapy. Um, the conundrum with brain is that it's difficult at times to understand if someone's having a stroke. It can, lots of different things can mimic themselves at stroke. If you have a special type of migraine, the symptoms are difficult to explain at time. The patient at the time of having the event might not be able to explain what's going on. So all of these things makes understanding someone having a stroke quite difficult. Heart attack is pretty easy. You have chest pain, you can speak, you can get a quick EKG, you know what's going on, you can easily get to the cath lab, you can put a stent in and get things done. And a stroke is a little bit more difficult. Unfortunately, with stroke, we don't have a great blood test that we can easily do to say, you're having a stroke right now. What type of stroke you have and what type of therapy we can give you. And the reason for the difficulty in understanding what's going on in the brain is because the brain lives in its own environment. It's covered by a membrane and a layer 
that doesn't really communicate that easily with the rest of the of blood outside, like such as plasma, where we take the blood samples from. So our goal is to be able to understand when someone's having a stroke, is there a signature in their blood that we can understand early on that they're having a stroke? Irrespective of what their symptoms are, we can really, based on the single blood test, diagnose it early on, because as you mentioned, brain uh, time is brain. The quicker that we can understand someone's having a stroke, the quicker we can uh, open up that artery, it makes a big difference. A lot of people know that brain is one of the fattiest parts of your body. Outside of the belly fat that you have, the brain is the biggest uh, content of uh, fats and lipids, and it's the brain. The reason for that is because it uses that fat as insulation because there's lots of electrons going back and forth, and they don't want to have any shorts in there. So we, the interesting other part is that lipids, these fat molecules, are the only molecules that actually can cross that layer or that membrane that we talked about that the brain doesn't like to connect with the rest of the body. So we're using that fact that the brain has a lot of fat molecules, and those are the molecules that potentially in a time of stress or even stroke can change and express themselves in plasma or the blood test that we can do. Wow, that was that exciting. I shut the whole place down. <laughs> um, so yeah, so even though I'm a interventional cardiologist, I put stents in a daily living. Most of the time, the other 50% of the time, I grew up as a chemist. I, uh, as part of my PhD, we looked at mass spectrometry, be able to understand small molecules in plasma. So I'm trying to use that technology to be able to understand what the lipid signatures in blood is so we can un understand when someone's having a stroke by a simple blood test. And that's our goal. Uh, unfortunately, up, up until now, unless you have a qualified neurologist a CT scan or some sort of an imaging uh, modality, which is quite uh, cumbersome and difficult to get at times, it's hard to say someone's having a stroke. It's hard to diagnose somebody with stroke and get them to the therapy that they need. So if, for instance, you can get a simple blood test in an ambulance that can tell you you're having a stroke, you need to go to this hospital to get the right care, that shaves off hours and hours of the time to therapy and can make a huge impact on someone who's having a stroke. Uh, because neurons die in a very rapid rate. The cells in the brain do not tolerate not getting oxygen. So the quicker we can open up that artery, hopefully with a blood test that we can come up with. Um, so that's the, uh, the goal for our lab. Our goal is to be able to understand a large group of patients with stroke, compare them to people who are not having a stroke, and to be able to uh, compare and contrast their plasma based on our technology to be able to understand, is there a signature that we can pick up that we can uh, easily diagnose stroke? That's for me. That was very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Barclay. Thank you very much. Uh, as mentioned before, I'm a physiotherapist, so part of the rehabilitation team. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about rehabilitation after stroke in general, and then talk a little bit about some of the research that I've been involved in related to stroke rehabilitation. So um, stroke rehabilitation can occur in a variety of settings. It can occur in the hospital setting, so in the acute um, hospital shortly after someone has been admitted, once they're stable, rehabilitation can start. Uh, some people may need to go for a little more time at a rehabilitation hospital as well. Um, and then there's also rehabilitation in the home setting, in somebody's own home, uh, and, and also in the community, for example, in an outpatient therapy clinic or department. Uh, during stroke rehabilitation, the people with stroke will identify what their own goals are uh, with some help from the rehabilitation team, and the team will help them to uh, attain their goals and to modify their goals as they, as they achieve other goals. So parts of the rehabilitation team include physiotherapists, as I mentioned, occupational therapists, people from social work, uh, speech-language pathologists, also nurses, rehabilitation physicians, and rehabilitation rehabilitation aides, and a variety of other people from other health care professions, depending on what the individual uh, needs, what they require. So as I mentioned, everyone identifies their own goals. People have their own personal goals as to what's important to them. Some of the goals that I have heard from people in the past when I've been working clinically is that, uh, for example, someone wanting to maybe use their affected arm uh, while they're eating, 
uh, perhaps somebody being able to want to walk independently indoors or being able to walk independently outdoors and in the community to get to places, go shopping, visit friends, get to transit, etc. cetera. Uh, some people will talk about wanting to start new hobbies or uh, restart old hobbies that they used to be involved with before their stroke. And that's something that the team can help them with. So whatever people's goals are. Um, what I wanted to mention was something called the um, Canadian Stroke Best Practice Recommendations. And these are um, available across Canada for uh, people who, uh, for um, clinicians who work with people with stroke. Also, there's a lot of information available for caregivers and family and people with stroke as well. And so these recommendations cover the whole area of care after stroke, from awareness and prevention to acute treatment to rehabilitation and recovery and also living in the community. So these uh, recommendations can be really important for clinicians working with people who've had a stroke because every month there are many, many uh, research articles that are published that are about different aspects of stroke. And it's very difficult or near impossible to know about, about all of these. And the recommendations will summarize these things with groups of experts and have them available so that clinicians can use them with their patients and clients during um, their stroke care. So some of the one portion of the recommendations is, of course, in rehabilitation. And in the rehabilitation recommendations, they talk about a variety of things, but in general talk about general principles for rehabilitation care and also some specific uh, treatment strategies. So one of the uh, general recommendations is that we use um, task-specific treatment. So that is a way of uh, forming your exercise session so that people are working on things, a very specific functional task, something that is important to them so that it's goal-oriented. And the task could be, if we give the example of using your arm to help you eat, uh, could be something like reaching for a cup and bringing it to the mouth. So we might break down that task, practice different parts of the task that are challenging for the individual, practice the whole task. So that would be an example of a task-specific or goal-oriented treatment. Um, and so any treatment with any goal can be designed in that way. And so that's the basis of, of what a lot of research is saying now um, that, is, that helps to work to improve functional goals for clients. Um, the other uh, I mentioned was um, specific therapy. So uh, an example of a specific therapy is something called mental practice, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and, and also looking at things like using a treadmill to maybe help improve your walking speed, if that's something that you, you want or, or need to be able to do. There are many, many um, specific uh, therapies that are suggested and recommended through the guidelines, and some that we know now that do not work or might be harmful and that we don't do. So I, um, when, as a researcher, I want, uh, we want to um, complete studies to have um, information available to clinicians so that they can use that information with their patients and clients. And, and that's how some of that information gets to be known is through these um, uh, guidelines or, or uh, best stroke practice recommendations. So related to some um, research that I have been involved in, um, I mentioned mental practice. So one study that we were involved in was looking at mental practice for improving arm function after stroke. And what mental practice refers to is thinking through an activity and how you'd go about it, what the different movement is at each joint um, to do the activity, but you're not physically practicing it. So the idea is that you, you mentally practice the activity um, only, and then later on when you go to physically practice it, um, you will hopefully see some improvement because you've also mentally practiced it. So some of the same areas of the brain that work while you're physically practicing work while you're mentally practicing or thinking an activity through. So an example, um, again, thinking of that bringing the cup up to the mouth, someone could be sitting quietly in their room, maybe with their eyes closed, and maybe listening to an audio tape of the activity of um, uh, bringing the arm forward, straightening the elbow, moving the wrist and opening the hand to grab the cup, grabbing the cup, bringing it towards you taking a drink, putting it down. And so the person is, again, thinking through these things and the steps, but not, not doing them. The, uh, 
so what we did was we did a systematic review which looks at pulls articles from a variety of different sources, so different randomized controlled trials, and we combine the results together statistically to get an overall result. And so what we found with this um, study was that um, we looked at uh, 25 studies that had been done across a variety of years, and uh, mental practice added to whatever conventional therapy the person was having um, showed an improved arm function and improved arm movement compared to just doing the regular rehab treatment. So um, mental practice could be used as an adjunct or an additional treatment to whatever your usual treatment is. It would never be expected to be used by itself, always an adjunct to physical practice, still need that physical practice, that's the most important. So the link to those best practice recommendations I mentioned is that uh, mental practice is recommended um, as an adjunct or an additional treatment to use for the upper extremity or for the arm to improve arm function. Um, and it's not for everybody, but uh, it's for, for those people that it is um, appropriate who would be able to use it. It, it may be beneficial. So the other area that I've been working in is telerehabilitation. And we know that since COVID, a lot of people, probably many people here, have um, perhaps had a physician visit or maybe a physiotherapist visit online through some sort of video conferencing platform. And so this is what we're talking about. And part of the, the CAN Stroke Recovery Trials Group, it's a group of rehabilitation researchers who work on multi-center rehabilitation trials. And so uh, we've been working on three different tele-rehab trials. One currently ongoing is looking at function of the leg and balance. Uh, it's called TRAIL, is the acronym. And um, we are looking at, um, we meet people um, twice a week, a physiotherapist meets individuals twice a week by Zoom and goes through uh, uh, exercises with with the participant uh, and then gives them um, a home program as well and exercises are made easier or more difficult for the individual depending on what they need and then it's progressed over the period of time that the study runs and our assessments are also done over zoom before and after the the treatment so um, what we want to look at is, is delivering stroke rehabilitation remotely or by tele-rehab um, beneficial for individuals and looking at not only the exercise component but also self-management component that's involved as, as an important part of rehabilitation as well. So we anticipate um, and hope that the results of these studies will um, add to the evidence of the use of tele-rehabilitation after stroke. So, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Barclay. So I would now like to open the floor for our discussion. Um, just a reminder, this is a discussion forum. So please try to keep your questions more broad in nature um, and not um, really personal or specific to individual treatment, because that's not why our presenters are here. <laughs> but yes, I, I welcome questions from the audience that are in attendance first. Are there any questions? Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Karen Fries, and I have a question for Dr. Barkley. Um, I'm wondering if in your rehabilitation process, if you've looked at cognitive exercise as another element to recovery. Um, that's not an area of my research, but there is research in the area looking at combining um, cognitive activities along with physical activities to strengthen um, recovery. So but is, not my area of research. Gotcha. Is there, is there someone in Manitoba doing that work or, or elsewhere? Oh, maybe. Oh, May I have um, a name? I, <laughs> um, a colleague of mine was doing some work with dual task treatment, so thinking about things or, or remembering things while doing activities. He's just retired, so <laughs> I'm not familiar with who else might be doing that work, not in Manitoba right now. Did you have someone? I think uh, I know that uh, somebody is doing it. I don't remember exactly the name, but I can. Uh, we can talk about that, and I can pass on the information. Much appreciated. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no problem. Are there any questions from the email online? 
Uh, yeah, we've got a question uh, coming from our online viewer. Um, they ask, what can you tell us about Botox treatments to help reduce stiffness in the arm and leg of somebody who has had a stroke? Who would like to take that question? <laughs> Um, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I would not, physicians will deliver a Botox treatment um, and it has been used to decrease spasticity or tightness in the muscle um, after stroke. I was hoping one of the physicians might have some more information. <laughs> yeah, so I'm also not the right person to answer this question because I deal predominantly with the acute part, like when the patient come in the uh, immediately after stroke onset and Botox is used after we deliver our treatment and then the patient still continue to have some residual deficit, that's when the Botox is more useful. So um, I think, uh, I don't think I can add much to what uh, Ruth has already mentioned, so. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. I learned a lot today, so I, I really enjoyed listening. Um, I have a question, general question. Um, I, I wonder how many people in Manitoba are impacted each year by a stroke, and I'm also wondering about um, are there differences uh, with genders, for example, in terms of uh, occurrences of stroke, but also uh, if I think about heart attacks, uh, the, the sort of cliche is that it may not necessarily be recognized for women as, as, as fast as for men. So I'm also wondering about stroke. I don't know anything about that. So that's my question. I can answer this question. I think uh, it's very important. And uh, let's start with how many Canadians have strokes. So roughly 100,000 people uh, get stroke every year. Okay, so if you translate to the population that we have, that means every five to 10 minutes, somebody's having stroke in Canada. So that's how common it is. Not only that, remember as uh, stroke results, not necessarily into death, but also long-term disability. So just around 900,000 pe people in Canada live with the effects of stroke at any given time. So that's that's what it is. In Manitoba, if you talk about it, again, Manitoba doesn't have very good data on it, but roughly around 2,000 stroke happens every year. 2,000, yeah. So that's, that's the number we, we to quote about. And you are so right. Uh, if uh, the stroke, uh, although stroke doesn't uh, um, look at the skin color, the race, the gender, but some people, some, some subgroup of our population do get aff affected more than others. Uh, women do get stroke, and uh, it's uh, how much ever we talk about the gender equality, we have to accept that there is inherent bias in our healthcare system, in our society, I should say. Uh, when women come with stroke, they are not necessarily uh, diagnosed with the stroke. So with the same symptoms, if a, ma ma a male person comes with the same symptoms and a female pers person comes with the same symptoms, the female are less likely to be diagnosed with stroke and hence less likely to be treated accordingly. Not only that, once the men and women have stroke uh, and men have some a woman at home to look after them, so they don't necessarily have to go home. But if women have stroke, they do not necessarily go through the complete rehabilitation therapy because they have to go back home to look after their men and the family. So those are, those are very, um, we can say, understandable reasons why there are differences in approach towards men versus women, but it also results in different outcome in men versus women. And, uh, you know, like women in younger age, they, uh, if they're, they're coming with signs of stroke, one of the very common um, thought process is that, oh, this is woman, she cannot have a stroke, uh, which is not right. And this is why it's very important to be aware. Uh, this awareness needs to come 
to the society to the physicians as well that guys women even at younger age can get stroke and uh, there is there are a lot of research fortunately happening these days about highlighting this issue one other point that uh, you brought up here is um, you know certain subsection of our population like our indigenous population who we know that they have a higher incidence of diabetes high blood pressure they also have higher incidence of stroke and not only that the stroke outcome in the indigenous population isn't the same as non indigenous population so one of the most recent paper that we just submitted for publication is on the systematic review of differences in outcome of in indigenous population versus non indigenous population we know that indigenous people have a higher death rate after a stroke they and they also have higher incidence of diabetes high blood pressure and also in in indigenous population as well women has worse outcome than men so there you go that i think that's that's something we need to be aware of more and more awareness need to be there so that we can uh, approach the two genders equally i'm just curious if anybody else on our panel has anything to add to that <laughs> yeah i think that's uh definitely correlates from the coronary artery disease or heart attacks that i come from especially with uh, stroke you mentioned a lot of the reviews and articles that come in to allow us as physicians to understand what the signs and symptoms are those studies are predominantly usually are looking at men to begin with so we are we are learning what we're taught and if the thing that we're learning is somehow skewed to begin with i think that's a problem i think over the past 10 years uh, a lot of the funding agencies a lot of the canadian agencies that fund research are making an effort to say that we need to do fundamental research that it's inclusive of both genders for instance even the signs and symptoms of stroke are they equally the same uh, you can't have just studies done where they're predominantly men which potentially for instance in heart disease are afflicted by but then we have to be able to understand how men and women present with stroke with heart attack uh, to include that so we're hopefully generating more new data that's more inclusive and so educate the hopefully some of the older physicians and some of the younger physicians coming up to say there's differences be aware of them and don't uh, just go by studies or research that's just been inclusively done on men so well and i'm curious dr barkley why do you think that men and women maybe have a different outcome after stroke when it comes to rehabilitation um, I think one one example that was given was about a, a caregiver role and um, and the, <laughs> the, uh, the caregiver role can be quite different between um, men and women. Um, and we know that there are sometimes differences between um, who might be able to go home if they have a caregiver at home or not. You're more likely to be able to return home after rehabilitation. Um, and is there a caregiver there? And so sometimes women, if they are living longer, may not have a caretaker at home or they may already be looking after someone at home. And so um, there has been known to be some differences there. Thanks. Are there any questions from online? Yes, uh, we have another question from online. Um, reads, a friend recently suffered a stroke and had many seizures. Uh, when one has had a stroke, are seizures common, and how do they affect rehabilitation? Dr. Shankar? Yeah, I think uh, I can address this. So seizures are not very common in stroke. But at the same time, we have to realize that there are two different types of stroke. So around 85% of the stroke happens because the blood supply to one of the poor one of the part of our brain has stopped. So that is called what we call a, a stroke in general. And we have been talking predominantly about that kind of stroke. It's called ischemic stroke. And the other 15% uh, patients who also have stroke-like symptoms, these are called hemorrhagic stroke, where the blood vessel has ruptured for one reason or the other in the brain. And seizures are much more common in patients with hemorrhagic stroke than ischemic stroke. And even in ischemic stroke, where the blood supply has been blocked to the part of the brain, they could get 
some kind of hemorrhage or brain bleed, and that could then result in seizure. So I think there has to be some component of um, of uh, uh, bleeding in the brain to cause seizures at in the acute stage, but. Over uh, in the chronic stage, after like days and months and weeks after the stroke, uh, seizures can happen even in ischemic stroke, and that is dependent on which part of the brain is involved. And uh, a part of the brain, which is right around uh, above the ears, is called temporal lobes. If the seizure is in that, uh, if the stroke is in that location, there is a higher likelihood that the patient may have seizure. Excellent. Oh, I see another question in the audience. Yes, I'm wondering, um, my husband here has had a stroke in November, and he's having a lot of problems with memory, like even fairly short-term memory. Um, you know, I can tell him something when we're in the basement of our house. By the time he's on the second floor, he's forgotten what it is. And, you know, it's, uh, he's, it's frustrating for him. Is there a treatment that is something that you, we could be doing in terms of... Um, therapy somehow that would help that. I can I can uh, do uh, say something on a lighter note. If uh, wife is is complaining about husband's memory, I think that's normal, no? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a joke. Okay, so joking a joke apart. Um, yes, um, unfortunately, uh, memory issue is pretty common in with stroke. And again, back to the same point, it depends upon which part of the brain is affected. And based on that, um, the symptoms are different. Okay? So sometimes if the patient may have only problems with their vision, sometimes with her hand, with their hand or legs, or sometimes the whole half of the body. So it all depends upon which part of the body is, or which part of the brain is affected. And memory is even more complicated because it's not, it's not necessarily dependent on one stroke. Some people um, get multiple stroke and that is called multi-infarct dementia. So they, people, when they get multiple my, mini strokes, the cumulative effect of multiple stroke could potentially cause memory memory impairment as well, as well. And don't forget that uh, stroke is not an isolated disease. So it's dependent on diabetes, hyper, high blood pressure, and diabetes and high blood pressure by itself could cause memory problems. So these all are, uh, these all go in parallel. Uh, so it's a complicated, do we have a treatment for that? That's the most difficult uh, component of stroke outcome to treat, honestly speaking. So there's not much hope there, uh, hope, uh, but there are new research coming up. There are new drugs coming up, which may be able to treat some sort of dementia, but not all of them. Um, one thing I could uh, suggest is um, visiting an occupational therapist who perhaps could do an assessment and provide some strategies to help you uh, uh, deal deal with that and uh, to make things a little easier. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes. Dr. Shankar, this one's for you again. Um, thinking of, you were talking about different areas of the brain um, dying. Do you, do you ever do functional MRIs in this process? And do you do comparisons? Have, has anyone looked at before and after? And tell us a little bit about that piece. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question, and you must have you must know you you have you must be knowing functional MRI. So, uh, for people who may not know what functional MRI is, it's like um, depicting a function, body function that you are doing on MRI. So what that means is uh, the person is, uh, person's head is put into the MRI machine and they are asked to do some, uh, some, some activities. Suppose most common activities tap the thumb, like tap the fingers like this. And we do the certain type of MRI where the part of the brain which is responsible for tapping the fingers will light up. And so um, what, what has been shown is, suppose there is a problem in that part of the brain, 
in some people, and that happens more common in younger people, that the other part of the brain could potentially take over that function. So the function, the lighting up in the brain may not be in the same area uh, where it is expected to be, but maybe in an adjacent area. Or sometimes, you know, um, uh, we majority of people are right-handed, and um, if the left part of the brain is damaged, the right side of the brain takes over that function as well. So that's what functional MRI is. The challenges with functional MRI is you have it, it, it takes time. In acute setting where time is brain, where roughly 2 million brain cells die every minute and we the whole system rush, rush, rush to save the brain, as much brain we can, functional MRI is not feasible. In fact, MRI itself is not feasible because MRI takes around 10, 15 minutes and you, someone who is very good at, with math, you can de decide how many, how many million brain cells will be dead by that time. So in the, in the acute stage, functional MRI is not done. But later on in the chronic stage, yes, functional MRI has been used to show the shift in the functionality of the brain and how we can use it further, we can tap, we can, we can redevelop the other areas of the brain to take over the activity. So there is a lot of research on that, but not so much in the acute phase. Good, I actually have a question. So if you have a family history of stroke, what's the number one most important thing you can do to try to prevent a stroke in the future? Well, nobody can uh, tell you that do not live a healthy lifestyle. That's the bottom line. So you live a healthy lifestyle and healthy lifestyle definition remains the same. Um, eat healthy, do a lot of physical activity, move around and uh, watch out for your weight, extra weight. Do not have that. Do not smoke. Do not, do not drink a lot of alcohol. Do not do drugs. A lot of those things. Watch out your sugar, high blood pressure, all those things. And I think uh, family history or no family history, this is very, very important. And I think uh, you want to, Amir, you want to say something? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think there's a lot of parallels between heart disease and uh, cerebrovascular disease. That's why Heart and Stroke as an organization represents both at the same time. Um, you mentioned if you have a family history, we can't really change our genetics, but there's modifiable risk factors that we can change. Some things are out of our control, but some things are in our control. How do we take care of our diabetes? How good our blood pressure is controlled? How is our cholesterol controlled? How active we are? We can be active participants in that process. And I think there's a lot of great medications, but I think being mentally active in all of those things, knowing that they're modifiable, that we're not doomed to have something because our family members had it. And genetics do play a role, but I don't think it plays that big of a role. There's a lot of modifiable risk factors. The things that we do on a daily basis over a lifespan of 70 or 80 years are the ones that are gonna eventually be the reason we'll have a stroke or not. So I think all those uh, daily activities, as you mentioned, uh, if you do have risk factors and if they're modifiable, there's lots of help out there. There's physicians out there. Thank thankfully, there's good medications out there as well that you can utilize, but uh, yeah. So if there's modifiable, you can modify them. That's good, thank you. I think there's another question online. Yes, another question from our online viewers. Um, other than calling 911 to get a potential stroke patient to hospital quickly, can anything else be done to buy more time for the person? They provide the example of giving a baby aspirin. That's a very good question. Um, there's not much, of, uh, much that we can do other than bringing the patient to the hospital. The one thing that I mentioned earlier, there's a, there is, we just finished a trial, clinical trial. Uh, there's a drug called, we, it's generically called no-no. It's not available right now. It's under research. Uh, that's what we are hoping that if the trial becomes positive, uh, this drug can be given in the ambulance or at the patient's home. And what it essentially does, it freezes the brain. So freezes the brain activity so that whatever damage has happened has happened, but no more damage will happen or 
the further damage will rate of further damage will reduce significantly so that the patients can be taken to the hospital at the earliest and uh, can be can be treated further could you get baby aspirin um, potentially yes but the baby aspirin doesn't start working right away so even giving a dose or two is not going to change anything uh, in the immediate uh, time frame so i don't think it will help a lot uh, in terms of stroke i think that right now as we stand right now our knowledge stand right now the best thing is to come to the hospital at the earliest and that that will and remember the other thing is we have to also know what type of stroke it is and that's why it's a little challenging unlike the cardiac disease where if somebody is having chest pain then we understand that this is the chest pain and you can start treatment likely in ambulance but here in stroke we have to have the diagnosis and the diagnosis uh, means we have to have the ct scan um, done to confirm what kind of stroke it is before we can treat it in certain jurisdictions in canada itself uh, there are uh, ambulances with ct scan in it we don't have it in manitoba um, and there is debate about how much that is effective in in curing and how much it changes the outcome of the patients but those are the those are the ways people are doing they do the ct scan in the ambulance and if we know that it's a ischemic stroke they can give the clot busting drug right in the ambulance so some of those are we are trying to uh, see how fast we can deliver the care to the patient uh, but right now i think the best thing we we can do for our patients is to come to the right hospital I think that, that's the, uh, the crux of the problem. I think a lot of times is, as you mentioned, aspirin in heart attacks, anybody having a heart attack, aspirin is good. But as you mentioned, depending on what type of stroke it is, one medication could be detrimental for the other. If your brain is bleeding, you don't want to thin the blood too much because that bleeding becomes worse. So unless you get to a place that has a CT scanner, has a qualified neurologist that can say, I think you're having a stroke, we need to get imaging done, it's very tough until that diagnosis is done to deliver the right therapy. Uh, so I think if we can come up with a, a device that easily in an ambulance can say, you're having an ischemic stroke, there's a clot blocking one of the arteries in your brain, you need to go to this hospital to get that clot out, or I can give you a medication right now that's going to dissolve that thrombus that's, or piece of clot that's blocking the artery. And the other side is, you're having a brain bleed, I'm not going to give you anything that's going to thin your blood. You need to go to the hospital, get a surgeon to get in there or an interventional radiologist to go in and put a plug in there and close things up. So I think that's the, the I find is the more frustrating part is getting to that diagnosis. We're very good at treating, but getting to that diagnosis is very difficult at times. I have a question for you. Will your blood test uh, give that ischemic versus hemorrhagic stroke distinction? That's exactly what we're trying to get at. I think that's the biggest fork in the road for therapy. Uh, we're looking at a study that was done at McMaster Hospital. They looked at 26,000 patients. It's called the Interstroke Study. They took a sample of every single person who came with a stroke. They compared them to people who very similar but didn't have a stroke, and they compared their blood tests for other things. So now they're giving us the blood tests, and as you mentioned, about 20% of these patients had a brain bleed as, as the reason for their stroke, and the about 70% had a clot in their brain. So we can compare and contrast the blood based on our analysis to see, can we pick out the signature that's lying deep in the molecules of their plasma? Can we dig that out, be able to understand it and make it into a very simple test? People say the brain is the next frontier. I'm, hopefully we can have a little tricorder eventually that we can just put on top of the brain and says, you're having a bleed in your brain. You need to go here or you're having a blocked artery. So our goal is to come up with a handheld device that's going to very quickly tell you you're having a stroke first and which type. Um, so that's our goal, being able to look at a large group of patients to be able to come up with the answer. Interesting. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes. Question for Dr. Ravandi. Um, coming from the cardiology space, you've seen many drugs be developed over the past, say, 20, 30 years that, that seem to be beneficial. Um, and yet, Dr. Schenker says in, in stroke, we've gone from zero drugs to one. Um, considering the similarities between the space, I guess it's, it's two questions. Why did the drugs that are beneficial in heart attacks not seem to help in stroke? 
Um, and then why is it so difficult to develop stroke drugs? I think one of the, the biggest parts are because of this duality in treatment of one is a bleeding and the other one is a clotting problem. Uh, in cardiology, it's always a clotting problem. You had too much cholesterol in your artery, that cholesterol broke off, the body thought something bad's going on, I'm going to put a clot in there. In cardiology, we never have anything bleeding. So we love things to thin the blood. In neurology and in the world of stroke, the problem with bleeding is always there. We have effective treatments to getting rid of clots, but if you give it to the wrong patient, it could be detrimental. The other part is the brain is, I shouldn't say this, but brain is way more sensitive than the heart. It virtually has no energy in it. So it constantly needs energy. And if it doesn't get it, it's not going to like it. So time is even more of the essence. Uh, you mentioned millions of cells dying every minute. That's absolutely true because the brain does not have uh, energy, energy stores within it. So the, the time is an issue. The duality of treatment is an issue. And to be honest with you, I think because in some ways car, uh, cardiac disease is so much more prevalent, we've had access to large clinical trials to quickly test therapies. In stroke, because of the diagnosis is difficult, like we had EKGs back in the 1950s to tell us you're having a stroke until the technology for CT scan and MRIs came about. So there's still, because of the difficulty where the brain exists, the way that strokes occur, and the fact that it's a little bit less prevalent than heart disease, enough patients you need to be able to prove these therapies. So that's, I think, maybe you can give us your... Yeah, no, I think that you're right, so right. And uh, only thing, like, because heart also always proceeded in research. So they have done, they have done quite a bit of research and I accept that. And we are only catching up with that now. So everything that happened 20 years back in the field of heart stroke is getting there now. So even like pulling out the clot, you'll be surprised. It makes sense, correct? But the evidence wasn't there until 2015. 2015, like how many years back were that? So 2015, only in 2015, we could safely prove that Pulling out a clot will make the patient better. It makes sense, but we couldn't have prove we couldn't prove it. In fact, uh, in 2013, two two years before 2015, there were three trials which actually showed that it it does not make a difference. And two years later, five trials showed that no, 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 it does make a difference. And the reason for that change in the shape of the evidence was because how rapidly we treat the patients. So suppose a patient gets stroke now and uh, goes slowly, go to multiple hospital, and then 24 hours later that, that uh, you treat that patient. Remember, 2 million cells per minute ha has been dying. So by the time you, the patient gets to the right hospital at that pace, you may not be able to save any brain. Whereas now what we have realized that, no, 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 you have to go really fast, as fast as possible. We literally, like I, I have pushed the patient's uh, bed to go fast. So that's, that's how fast we need to do. And now we realize when we do things faster, then we can save more brain. So we, it's, it's all about research. We are understanding what we did yesterday, what all, like analyzing that carefully. Like we, if we treated 100 patients yesterday and did slowly, maybe five patients we did fast. So now we know that's a signal. So those patients who we treated them faster did better. So now we started to do things faster for every single patient and then find out which patient, uh, maybe there is still some subgroup may not do better. Some subgroup may do better even at 48 hours. So we all are different. Our genetics genes are different. So some of us have different set of blood vessels in the brain where the brain may continue to be alive for much longer. So those patients, those are very few people, but they, those patients do benefit from, from this treatment even up to 48 hours from the onset of symptoms. But that's not the usual case. So that message shouldn't go out that wait that long. Go fast, as fast as possible. Every minute counts in stroke. Thank you. I think there's another question by email. Yes. Um, Jean asks this question to each of the experts. Uh, do you foresee increased use of telemedicine in diagnostic medicine or in physiotherapy? Um, well, I, I believe 
we'll probably see increased use of tele-rehabilitation uh, for rehabilitation purpose. Um, certainly, it was used to a certain extent during, during COVID. Um, and also, there, we know that not everybody lives in an area that has a stroke rehabilitation unit, for example. So certainly for people who are more remote, of course, the access to internet, et cetera, is, is an issue as well. Um, but I can see for that reason, it's certainly being um, used more and more. And the studies that, that we're doing right now, led by um, researchers at, at University of British Columbia and McMaster, um, we are looking at people who are already finished their inpatient and outpatient rehabilitation. And so it's a slightly longer time after stroke and people are living at home in the community. And sometimes it's hard to access community rehabilitation. So the tele-rehab is certainly an excellent option should it prove to be um, useful. Good, okay. Are there any other questions from the audience? Any other questions by email? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we do have a couple more online. Uh, Jeffrey Kuffner asks, uh, there was a mention of coming to the right hospital. How important is it, it is the choice of hospital I go to uh, in our province, or should I just get somewhere as quickly as possible? I think this is a very important question, and I have to emphasize, re-emphasize that going to the right hospital makes a huge difference. And I'll give you a very practical example. If somebody is living across the street from Grace Hospital, you think you can get to the Grace Hospital within minutes, but don't go there. Call 911 because we have the ambulance bypass policy that simply means that even if you're living or you're found with the signs of stroke next to another hospital. But if that hospital isn't the stroke hospital, then the ambulance is not going to take you to that hospital. Ambulance will redire be redirected to the right hospital because you need to get to the team, stroke team, where the right team will give you the right treatment in right time. Uh, in our province, um, Health Sciences Center is the only comprehensive stroke center where all kind of therapy is available, but there are seven other primary stroke center that is called Tele Stroke Center, uh, where um, people who are living outside Winnipeg will be taken to, depending upon the proximity to that particular center. And then what happens is, even in those primary stroke center, the stroke neurologists who are in Health Sciences Center can see them through telemedicine and diagnose stroke and give the medication right there. And if needed, they, then they will be transferred over to Health Sciences Center to fetch the clot out if needed, yeah. So going to the right hospital is the most important thing. Yes, there's another question from the audience. <laughs> no, go ahead. When my husband went to, in the ambulance that came to pick him up, um, he was in, they were instructed to take him to the grace. That's a, that's a very good question. It also depends upon how, how soon after the onset of symptoms he was diagnosed because there is a time window. So the, uh, the clot busting drug can be only given within four and a half hours from the onset of symptoms. And our uh, a clot, pulling the clot out can be, usually we do it up to 24 hours. So most of the time, if the patient has, uh, there are two things. If the patient has minor stroke, which is not a uh, major stroke, which means that may not have a big deficit, big functional deficit, in that case, uh, they may not be going to the uh, health sciences center. And also, if they are not found in that time window, then also they may not go to the health sciences center. And one of the biggest challenges, the stroke is not painful, unlike heart attack. And most people do not even know when, when did it actually start. And the other problem is there may, may not be somebody with the person to tell actual time of onset. Or the, the person went to bed last night and woke up this morning with stroke. So we don't know what was the time of onset. In those cases, it's very, it becomes difficult to direct 
the patient to the right hospital. So I don't know, I, we can talk about individual situation, what situation it was, but most likely one of these conditions might have been there uh, because of which he was not taken to a health sciences center. Yeah. As I recall, I was upstairs working in my office on my computer and I came downstairs and my voice was all garbled. I, my rec recollection of everything is my wife phoned and an ambulance came fairly quickly. And I remember them coming into the house, sticking me on a thing and taking me out to the ambulance very quickly. There was also a fire truck there. I think the fire trucks got there first. Um, we were sitting, waiting in the ambulance, and he says, the driver is waiting to be instructed where to take you. And Grace is where I went. 16 hours later, my kids were taking me home. And I don't think I've had any um, serious side effects since. Certain, certain memory uh, things. I think I've forgotten anything that I didn't want to remember. And I remember everything that I do want to remember. It's, it's hard to say. I, I think it's quite possible that you may be recovering from stroke science symptoms by the time the ambulance driver came to you. And that may be other reason why they, you may not go to the uh, health sciences center. So some people start having stroke and they recover on their own. Uh, and which is a good sign. I think it looks like you, you had some, some, something of that sort. Um, we can talk about that more after this session. I think, are there any other questions in the room or can we take another one from online? Great. Uh, we have one more from online. Um, uh, this is about uh, the age of, uh, of stroke patients. I wonder if we could hear a little bit uh, in general about that. And the question is, uh, is the average of a stroke, uh, the average age of a stroke patient getting younger now versus 20 years ago? Um, <laughs> well, I think uh, there are two ways to look at it. Um, one is uh, overall, like we are getting better in detecting stroke. So that's likely the case that we are detecting strokes in younger people as well. So our understanding of stroke has uh, changed. And some of the risk factors that we always used to think will happen only at older age, like high blood pressure, diabetes, is also becoming much more prevalent in younger age group. So as long as those risk factors are there, the age may not be a bar, and so the stroke could happen in younger age as well. So age isn't necessarily a bar. We have the youngest I have pulled clot out of the brain is six year old. So if that gives you a sense of age for stroke patients, um, of course the the disease process, the pathophysiology of stroke in younger patient is slightly different than though that we see in the older patient. But stroke does happen in younger patients as well. Not necessarily increasing in incidence, but more kind of awareness is what, what I think is happening. I have a question for Dr. Barclay. So what do you think is the most important thing that can be done to help improve recovery after stroke? Um, well, um, I think a, a really important thing, um, like I'd mentioned, is people set their own goals as to what's important to them. So that's very important that they set goals important to them. If they have family members, so whether it's a relative or friend, neighbor who is there to support them and help them with their goals as well, that's also really important. Um, and people work really hard in stroke rehabilitation, so that's a big part of it. People do a lot of work. Um, and they have a, a large, having a team there to support is, is very important as well. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yes. 
Maybe a follow-up question to that. I know my mom is really good. If she gets instructed by the doctor to do something, she does do that exactly the way they tell her to. Um, just wondering, in your profession, um, is there anything you do to encourage people to actually do what is good for them? Um, and, and what would that be? So to, to encourage people to really do what's good for them. Uh, certainly, uh, part of part of what we'll do is is education and information about how important exercise can be and how it can be a benefit. Um, also, different ways of encouraging people. We may use different types of feedback. There's research in different types of feedback and how often you give feedback and what type of feedback you give that might help somebody with their motor learning or learning how to remove again. Um, so there is a whole literature around that. And so we try to use some of these strategies or we might use other types of feedback like biofeedback, for example, or audiovisual feedback that can also help people to uh, maybe learn a little bit better than if they didn't have it. So sometimes that kind of information is something that we will will do to, to assist. And are there support groups? And maybe that's a question for the heart and stroke person that's here. I just wonder, are there support groups that people can reach out to, to share their feelings and, and what they go through? Uh, there, there definitely are. Um, sometimes in the in the hospitals, there are groups set up or visitors, uh, people who've had stroke before, and will come and visit people and talk to people who are are interested. Um, there's some um, groups within the city, Stroke Recovery of Manitoba, as well. Um, there's information online from them, from Heart and Stroke, from March of Dimes. There's a variety of places that may offer information and offer support groups that might be in person or online as well. Thank you. Are there any more questions by email? Uh, no, uh, okay. that was our last question from okay. email. Just curious, I don't have a watch on. What time is it? <laughs> uh, we're uh, past quarter after eight. Okay, so. good. I would like to ask kind of one final question. So you guys have talked about diabetes, hypertension, high blood pressure, et cetera, that lead to our potential risk factors. Do you think there is one like single worst risk factor for stroke? You, you can do say that. I, I think uh, blood pressure plays a huge role. Yeah. I think hypertension is one of the unfortunate silent uh, uh, killers from stroke because it's not usually we don't feel we have high blood pressure. It can go on for many years without being diagnosed. So again, it's very important to have a good relationship with your family doctor, get that checkup at least for blood pressure, and then down the list uh, you can go. Interestingly, looking at um, the inter-stroke study that we get samples from, they've actually looked at 26,000 patients and they figured out what is the biggest risk factor that you can have that would predict your first stroke. Blood pressure obviously was one, your cholesterol was two, but high up there was having a stressful life. So stress was way up there, very close. It was very interesting that these investigators had the, I don't know, had the foresight to ask that question. Mm -hmm. And so having modus of control in your life is a big predictor of obviously having stressful life. That's a big, uh, big, big uh, stroke, stroke risk factor. So yeah, blood pressure for me would be the number one. I, won I wonder whose, whose workplace is not stressful. That's just it. I'm going to go home and meditate. <laughs> Good. Are there any other questions from the audience? Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. And thank you, experts, for your insightful um, uh, discussion. I learned a lot. And I hope you guys got um, something out of this evening. And I would like to encourage you to tune in in two weeks time on March 29th for the next Cafe Scientifique, which will be on understanding racism during the COVID-19 pandemic with research from Canada, the United States and Mexico. Details about this event can be found on the Cafe Scientifique website. So thank you all for joining us and for participating in tonight's discussion and have a good evening. Thank you.